Um, I'm Alison Daly. I'm a JRF here at Teddy Hall. And what I'd like to do um, with my talk, since I'm a paleontologist, is I'm going to take you back in time, uh, much, much further back than the dinosaurs. We're going back 500 million years. And the Earth looked very different at this time. So on land, it was fairly barren. There was maybe some microbes living in soil, but that's it. But down in the oceans, we had complex and diverse communities of animals that look very, very different from what we have today. Uh, these communities uh, we know about from incredibly well-preserved fossils. And they tell us a story about a very sudden increase, the sudden appearance of animals globally in a very short period of time, about 30 million years, which sounds long, but actually geologically, a very short period of time. We go from nothing really in the fossil record telling us about animals to an incredibly diverse community. These fossils are incredibly special. They're unusual. Normally you think of fossils as bones or hard shells. But these 500 million year old fossils are completely soft bodied. So you get skin preserved, eyes. We can see the nervous system in some of these animals, the circulatory system, even the gut, sometimes with the final meal still in place. So unbelievably good preservation um, of these fossils. Oops. These fossils were originally found at sites such as these. This is the Burgess Shale, located in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. And you can see the quarry here with most of these slabs of rock actually show um, some of these incredibly um, lovely fossils. This was discovered by this gentleman here, Charles Walcott. And because of this discovery and how important the Burgess Shale is for understanding the evolution of animals, he's become kind of a hero to paleontologists. So what you see are people yeah. always yeah. imitating Walcott, you know, when they visit the quarry or even this one. He's not even at the Burgess Shale. He's yeah. just like yeah. making this pose in front of his favorite rocks. Um, these fossils were made uh, well known to the uh, sort of non-scientific community through books such as Wonderful Life, one of Stephen Jay Gould's most famous book, who, by the way, he also yeah. pulled a Walcott. So you can see this in the back of his book. So this is an incredibly important discovery. Um, and what's so interesting about these animals is that they look totally bizarre compared to what we have today. Just as an example, I'll introduce here Hallucigenia, who got his name because literally Walcott thought he was hallucinating when he saw the animal. It was originally reconstructed to be walking on this pair of spines with no joints, so he's somehow walking like this as best it could. But then we re-examined the fossils and it was found that actually we'd We'd, we'd reconstructed him upside down. We had to turn him over, and then he's walking on some soft legs here, a much more um, functionally likely interpretation. By far, one of the most bizarre fossils from the Cambrian explosion has to be a group of animals known as the Anomalocarids. Um, and this is a, a photo of Anomalocaris, the sort of um, the animal from which this whole group takes his name. Now, these, these guys were quite large, about half a meter to a meter in size, when everything else was only a few centimeters. And they've become quite famous um, from Burgess Shale animals because they're interpreted to be apex predators. So they're thought to be um, what was swimming around eating everything else. You can see in this image, he's kind of looming over this little morella in a terrifying kind of way. And we think he's a predator. Um, you know, such as this, eating some trilobites. This is based mainly on his morphology. So you see him grabbing some animals here, large eyes for seeking out prey. Um, and here we have another very cute example of him swimming along. And some examples of the fossils that tell the story. These sharp claws. He's got a, a round mouth with sharp teeth. Um, another species has a different type of claws. So we use the morphology of the fossils to suggest he was the apex predator of these ecosystems. Uh, for the last 10 years or so, I've been re-examining a lot of material. We have some complete bodies preserved, uh, really spectacular preservation, which when you look in detail, you can start to see some amazing things. So this is a close-up of the body. We can actually see blocks of muscle with individual muscle fibers. Um, we can also see the gut, as I mentioned before, and divide this into the foregut and the midgut. And we can get from this information a really good idea of how this animal moved, how it would have eaten, what, you know, even what it was likely to have been eating. 
and make reconstructions such as this with both internal and external features. More than just um, looking at the morphology of known species, a lot of new taxa have been found in the last few years as well. So this is a completely new anomaly carid that I described in 2009. Um, it was unknown before this, and it turns out to be really weird. It's got this kind of box sticking out the front of its head. This was completely empty. Its mouth is here, its appendages are here, its eyes are there. And we don't know what it was for. It was just swimming around with this big, like, three sides of a box in the front of its head. What it was used for is, is really anyone's guess. Uh, we make these discoveries by going out into the field, um, finding new quarries. This is a site called the Stanley Glacier Quarry, just discovered in 2008. We go and we make lovely excavations like this and hopefully find some really nice fossils. So there's me. That's what I look like when I haven't showered in three weeks. So yeah. <laughs> very nice. While I was doing my uh, work, on doing this field work and looking at the new animal Herdia, suddenly there was a bunch of news stories that came out talking about anomaly carids. And they had headlines such as, earliest predator wasn't so fierce, or Cam Cambrian's fiercest hunter, hunter defanged. And then giant shrimp-like predator was a weakling after all. <laughs> this is getting a bit personal, but my <laughs> ultimate favorite was giant vicious-looking vicious ancient shrimp was a disappointing wimp. I don't know who he's disappointing. I thought only I had all my hopes and dreams riding on these animals, but apparently he was disappointing. So this was based on work by one of my colleagues, Whitey Hagedorn, who had modeled the mouth parts of anomaly carids. And... Um, his calculations showed that the mouth parts were not hard enough to be actually grabbing things like trilobites, which had a mineralized exoskeleton, and chewing them up. So he was making some models suggesting, you know, guys, maybe, maybe they're not really an, um, top predators after all. And my own research was, was seeing a similar trend. So here we show these mouth parts, this oral cone again. Um, this morphology was the only one described for several decades. But it turns out there's a lot of different um, sizes and shapes, different numbers of plates. Um, some of them have extra rows of teeth, which look quite fierce. But some of them are relatively soft and have hardly any teeth at all. So this is suggesting uh, maybe there, there's different modes of feeding going on with these animals. The same is true when you look at the appendages. So these are the big arms with claws that stick out from the front of the head we see a huge variety of morphologies here. And when you sort of look at these quite systematically, you can see two main groupings, which you can draw a line down the middle. So there's some that are quite long and narrow. They have relatively short spines and a good range of motion. And then you have some like these that don't seem to be moving a lot. They're always preserved in very um, sort of the same position. They have long spines that you know, look like they would tangle up if the animal was moving too much. So one of the things I've suggested is that they're using these um, appendages in different ways. So these narrow ones, they could actually grab things with. And they were probably active predators being able to grab a, a prey and, and manipulate it to the mouth. Whereas here you have appendages that don't really have a wide range of motion. So they might be more generalized. So I picture these guys with their appendages out the front of the head, and they're kind of maybe sifting gently through the sediment or through the water column, and entangling prey and other organic matter and gently sweeping it towards the mouth. So they're not going to be actively picking a prey item and going after it. They'll just get whatever they can. Uh, last year, uh, there was a publication on this anomaly carid named Tamisio caris. It's found in uh, Greenland. And they found some really fantastic specimens that showed very long spines on the appendage, which had tiny hairs coming off those spines. At the same time, some colleagues and I were working on material, slightly younger material, from Morocco. And we saw the same thing. These appendages with long spines, they had spines coming off that and hairs coming off that. So they've, in both cases, these two different anomaly carids have created a, a very fine net sort of a, a mesh, if you will, on their appendages. In both cases, we're suggesting that these guys were actually filter feeding. So they weren't active predators at all. Um, they were just sort of swimming along. This is a reconstruction of the animal from Morocco. Um, 
And it's, the idea was it was um, sort of filtering whatever it could from the water column, very, very fine-grained material, uh, very fine-grained organic matter, uh, microscopic in fact. So this is um, a, a slightly different way of filter feeding. Normally you think of filter feeding, it's sessile animals that are stuck to the sea floor um, that, that um, aren't moving very much. But these guys could actually sort of swim through the water column. So you could think of them rather than uh, being an apex predator like a great white shark, they're more like a gentle whale just um, sort of gently swimming through the ocean, uh, filter feeding to get their meal. So whereas we used to just have this idea that anomalocarids were all fierce apex predators and they were all active and grabbing things and it was this very ferocious and terrifying beast, actually we find a very wide range of ecologies for these animals. So we've sort of overturned the paradigm that they're apex predators. We see that they have generalized predation, they're also suspension feeding. And they're probably doing this to alleviate competition between each other. At some sites we see up to eight or ten different taxa in the same bed of rock. And if these were all actively trying to go for one, one prey item, it would probably be really high competition. So instead it seems like they're alleviating competition by partitioning the prey source. And this overall is telling us, you know, the Cambrian ecology was actually quite complex. Um, you know, people thought, well, it's 500 million years ago, maybe it's a very simple ecology. Actually, what we're seeing is an incredibly complicated um, in ecological interactions, even though these animal communities are so old. So perhaps this uh, idea, this reconstruction I showed at the beginning, maybe isn't entirely accurate, particularly as this guy seems to have the more generalized um, predation morphology. So maybe we need to make a few adjustments um, to these kinds of reconstructions um, and, and realize it was very sophisticated um, ecological, uh, very sophisticated ecological community. Thanks.